So hello everyone, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I think the best place to start before we get into talking about coronavirus and looking forward as opposed to where we are now and the exit strategies and things like that, it would be great if you could all just kind of introduce yourselves um, a bit about um, your business, your role um, and uh, kind of where um, where your clients are at or where the chefs you've spoken to are at and then we'll, we'll go from there, okay? So Richard, let's start with you. Most people probably know who you are but give us a little breakdown of, of what you do. Oh. Well, I'm Bloomberg's chief food critic, and in an ordinary week, I'm probably out eating five or six times. So, as with probably most people on the call, this is a totally new experience for me sitting home all the time. Actually, I'm quite enjoying it, really. I'm treating it as, as a bit of time out, I suppose. But I am doing some stories on where chefs are and the charity efforts and so on, and uh, the chefs' reactions are very different. But of course, everyone's terribly worried. Maybe I'll, I'll say more about it later. Yeah, okay. And and Tom, what about you? Obviously, um, Crab Communication is quite a, a, it's a new startup for you. So um, give us a bit more about that and, and how this has affected you. Yeah, so we, um, Jess, Corrigan, Tess Berry and I founded Crab Com uh, Crab Coms in January, just as, uh, just getting our clients going and getting everything up as coronavirus hit, which was a bit of bad luck. But um, We've been okay since then. I guess we're more fortunate in some ways because we don't have the overheads that other bigger companies have or any staff. Um, but yeah, we've we've been working it through it with our chefs, and well, I guess we'll talk more about that as well. Yeah. Okay. And Nikki, what about you guys? What about Source? So Source, um, it, we're in a funny year because we we um, were looking forward to celebrating our 20th year anniversary in May. So never would we have predicted a time that we'd, you know, we'd fallen upon, but we're still in close contact with all our clients, trying to help them, support them. A lot of them are behind the big campaign, National Time Out. Um, and yeah, it, it's, we're just trying to be in close contact with all of our clients. We're hugely lucky because we also look after lots of brands. So they're obviously in a stronger position at the moment, the Estrellas and the Mirabeau and the Jews. Um, but going back to restaurants, we're just talking, everybody's got a different opinion. Um, everybody's in a different situation. Um, but yeah, we'll go on to talk about that further later. Okay, and, and uh, lastly, but by no means least, Tanya, uh, we'll let you go. Um, so I'm the founder of um, Gerber Communications, and uh, which is a, a, a communications agency that specializes in hospitality and lifestyle. And similarly to, to Nikki, you know, we, we sort celebrated a, uh, our 10 years um, and half, halfway to where you guys are but you know it was a big moment for us and we were really excited about this year so um, it's been uh, disappointing I suppose but I think um, we because we look after all sorts of different clients ranging from Michelin star restaurants to larger groups everyone is experiencing it in different ways and um, you know some are actually still active others uh, mostly not and we're trying to support in whichever way we can um, you know throughout this period so and yeah we'll, I guess we'll go into more detail on how that's working. Yeah and I mean I know you've said that everyone's got lots of different opinions who you're talking to but maybe you could you could pick um, a particular chef or restaurant or someone and um, that is very vocal about a certain area of this that they're, that they're wanting to uh, discuss or that they're particularly worried about um, if there's anyone that springs to mind it would be interesting to know how they're thinking going forward because I've spoken to a lot about pe people of how they feel now but what are they thinking going forward should I take that okay yeah. <laughs> um I've been impressed by how everyone's swung behind Jonathan Downey in that effort it's really the industry has spoken with a completely unified voice even though people have different interests and emphasis I find the big differences between the chefs and the restaurants so for example I was speaking to Tom Sellers at Restaurant Story and his view was that you know when people can go back to restaurants they're going to want the whole experience and probably no great changes and then somebody like Claire Smith I spoke to yesterday about core and she's just saying how's it going to work if they really have to have chefs uh, waiters in uh, gloves and masks and tables far apart is that going to work because people go to restaurants for a kind of social experience and fun and that doesn't sound much fun and neither, neither does it fit in the fine dining and then I spoke to Desgan Wardner of D&D at the Star Troll list. He says it's going to be party time. At that stage, he said it will be party time when this, all this ends because everyone's going to be dying to get out of the house and enjoy themselves. But I'm 
wondering if he's changed his mind. So I think the feeling generally now is it's going to be quite a slow start when uh, when restaurants and bars, particularly bars, finally reopen. Yeah, and from a PR point of view, what are you kind of advising people, uh, your clients, when they're when they're talking to you? Um, Nikki, let, let's start with you. I think at the moment, because we don't know when lockdown is going to be lifted, we can only um, take it by day by day at the moment. Different different clients are doing different. We look after 1251. They're doing a very successful delivery business at the moment. So there's more to talk about on a daily basis. But we are waiting to hear when lockdown's lifted, what the strategy will be. I was chatting to Sat Baines again. He was saying it might be easier to social distance from the front of the restaurant, but how are they going to social distance in the kitchen? There's so many individual challenges that they're going to have to overcome. Um, yeah, it's just keeping close contact, talking and waiting and hearing, you know, some people are talking about the three phase lockdown lift where restaurants will be the last. I've spoken to a lot of big hoteliers who are opening their, hoping to hope, open their hotels mid-July, but the F&B will not be opening at the same time. So it's case by case. Yeah. I think, I th I, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, it, you know, there's so, no one really knows what the other side is going to look like yet. So much is going to change. And I think that until we have more information, until we know what that consumer confidence is, is going to look like, because you know, until we know that, we don't really know what um, the restaurant, how the restaurant's gonna be able to, to operate, to your point, Richard, about you know, having 50% occupancy screens, whatever. I mean, personally, I just, you know, I don't think that how that, I don't see how that can work, um, you know, from a sort of, uh, I don't know how, how that can be financially viable for a restaurant um, and, and, and then as well as trying to consider what kind of experience that's going to offer to the customer. Um, so I think there's a lot of unknowns. And in the meantime, um, all of our uh, clients, as I'm sure the same with yours, uh, Tom and Nikki too, are trying to work behind the scenes to work out what they can be A, doing now, um, whether it's delivery, um, you know, takeaway, whatever, and, and, and in the process, try to sort of think about the options for, for, for the other side. Um, I mean, I think ultimately this is about an evolution of engagement with audiences. So obviously, you know, it's always been about trying to engage with an audience, but now that this has happened, it's going to be more important than ever. And it, it, it is about an evolution. So it's like all of these things that we've been talking about for quite a long time. And I, I know like as an agency, we've been trying to deliver a, 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 an integrated approach using all the platforms that are available to us now, but now that's going to be more important than ever. So um, whether it's restaurants pivoting to delivery or takeaway, um, whether it's, um, you know, in, and in that way they are, they've got their access to data. They're also coming into people's houses, um, whether they're doing home cooking uh, videos, tutorials, they're, providing access to the to their audience you know direct access which otherwise they would not have been able you know to, to have um it's it, it's looking at how those audiences can be engaged in a in a in a much more powerful and more direct way and that is um is obviously going to affect marketing as well and so i think that you know with marketing it's going to be a similar thing it's about the evolution of, of, of those, you know, that approach and, and utilizing the platforms in a much more sophisticated way, probably. So, you know, with content, it's about which format is that content going to, you know, how, how, what, what format are you going to use to communicate that content, which platform, which channel, you know, all of that is going to be, you know, much more important than it's ever been because people are just consuming everything digitally. Yeah, and um, Richard obviously mentioned that you eat out five times plus a week. And uh, Tom, uh, you're probably very similar because as well as doing PR, obviously you have your um, Instagram as well. Yeah. I mean, we all eat out. I'm sure we're all missing it very much. But um, but yeah, just what's your take on uh, on on <clears throat> what um, restaurants are going to be like going forward, Tom? Because obviously experience is a big part of it. So and for someone that not just does PR, but also, you know, you share that on your social media. It's something else that, that you do. What are your feelings on it going forward? 
I think it will it will remain it will go back to the way it was at some point. I think, like Richard was saying, we all imagined when this started that it would be a bit like VE day, and uh, they'd say twelve o'clock on the first of June, our restaurants will open, it will go back to normal, hurrah, let's celebrate, and that's very much changed now. Um, I think it will be good in some ways that certainly for Instagram, um, I think it will it's brought out a sense of community in everyone. People are focusing on, you know, your restaurant up the road rather than necessarily the bigger chains and, and restaurants like that. But ultimately, it will go back to the way it was. Um, and we're, we're keeping an eye on what's going on in Hong Kong and the rest of Asia and Europe as they start to open up, just in the hopes that you can sort of <laughs> grab some ideas for what you can do. Because I, I certainly can't imagine going to a restaurant and being served by someone in PPE. It just mm. it seems completely out of this world, you know, something out of a movie. Yeah, but it, yeah, very strange, very strange times. Yeah. Um, before we talk a bit more about um, exit strategies for, for yourselves as well as um, obviously your clients, um, I just wanted to quickly ask you all about um, the guides this year and what you thought about those. Because um, I don't know, do you think that they can still go ahead? Do they need pausing? Something, for example, like Michelin, where they have to go out and they have to see um, all the different restaurants on a regular basis, they're obviously not going to be able to to fulfil that. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Richard. I'll, I'll start with you. It's hard to see, isn't it? I mean, things like Michelin Guide, in theory at least, depend completely on the regular visits to the restaurants. The only thing is with Michelin in particular, they're so commercially driven. I wonder whether they'll try and square the circle somehow, but I find it pretty difficult to believe they're going to be able to bring out a credible guide this year. And is guide something that chefs are still thinking about, or is that the last thing that's on their mind? Well, I guess, I guess at the moment it's the last thing on their mind, but as you know, chefs are crazy for Michelin in general, and they just love it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be quite a big disappointment for people. As you know, Michelin this year, for the first time, is or was planning a big public event at the Roundhouse. I can't remember when it was, when it is. Is it July, August or something? Uh, no, I think it's October. <laughs> Yeah, is it October? Yeah. Oh, maybe that can go ahead. Maybe they can do it. If if the shutdown turns out just to be two months, say, maybe they'll be okay. But uh, I obviously, I have no idea at this stage. Yeah. And from a PR point of view, that's obviously, it's a big thing, isn't it, for a lot of your clients, the guides. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's not the be all and end all, but, you know, they might all say they don't cook for them, but they I mean, want I them. think it would so... take the <laughs> out, out of your sales a little bit if you got your mission star for the first time this year. Because yeah. you're, you're not going to be able to celebrate. You're not going to be, you know, that is yeah. what fills a restaurant in most cases. Mm. Um, so, I mean, obviously it would still be incredible if they did it and you've got a star. But it would really be the bad years to get your first perhaps star, or even if it's your second or third, frankly. I think the guides are still very, very important. But I think at the moment people are focusing on survival. And I was talking to, we were talking to Jason and Jason Atherton from the social group. And he says he feels if we don't get this nine month rent free period and they don't prolong the furlough, a lot of restaurants, I think it was the caterer yesterday said they predicted 40% of restaurants wouldn't get through. So I think the guides will come back to the forefront of everybody's minds. But at the moment, I think it is survival and getting through and looking after your staff is the main priority. Yeah. yeah. I I think, I th I absolutely, I, I kind of think, you know, everybody is thinking of this year as being the year that things are on hold. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, as Nikki says, it is, it is literally about survival and getting through these, um, you know, these next few months. And I, th I think those opening weeks and months are going to be the hardest. I think we're very much in a sort of calm before the storm period. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I think I think it is going to be. I, th I think it's, it is unfortunately going to come down to. Um, well, obviously, you know, if 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 those um, if the rent free period get gets um, gets through, and um, you know, all of those things are absolutely crucial. Um, but I think it is going to come down to survival of the fittest at the end of the day, which is you know, um, it's it's going to be really tough. And what's sort of ironic about all of this and the fact that the hospitality industry is, is in the situation it's in, you know, it's being hit the hardest, is the fact that food's never been more important than it is right now, right? I mean, you know, it's, uh, we, there are very few uh, pleasures uh, that we have to enjoy and food is probably the, the main one. And so um, I think, I, I, you know, I hope that with everything that's, um, you know, with the sort of focus on food and also everything that, you know, Jonathan Downey has done and everything that's being sort of pushed 
for the hospitality industry will mean actually that you know the hospitality industry gets um, more attention than in, it has in the past as a, as a you know as as a proper industry, which I don't think it's really had before. Yeah, I've heard that a few times when I've been chatting with people that they hope that that is the one positive that comes out of it, that it gets the respect that it that it hasn't had and that it deserves. So yeah, mm. I think everyone's definitely on the same page with that one. And um, picking up on what you said about um, possibly the survival of the fittest, and probably we are going to see a lot of restaurants drop off that just can't survive this, which is really really mm. sad. What does mm. that mean um, for um, from a PR point of view? It, it, obviously, that's it's less people to do PR. For? and is that then more competition for you guys not to be controversial but you know how does that work from a PR world is that going to be tough for you I mean I think I think you know everybody on the planet probably uh, you know certainly in our industry is going to is having to diversify um, so you know as we discussed with the restaurants you know they're having to look at other things or delivery take away home tutorials, whatever, and, and thinking about all the other things that they can offer as a business. Um, and the same applies to agencies. Um, you know, it, 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 of course, I mean, certainly our business is very heavily reliant on the hospitality industry and without restaurants, you know, it, it's going to be tough. I mean, we do have other um, clients that are, are, are not restaurants, um, which is meaning that, you know, we haven't furloughed our entire team, um, but, um, I definitely think that there is going to be a place for PR. There's going to be a need for it, in, uh, arguably more than ever. But I think, again, it's going to come down to um, adapting, um, you know, it, as I said before, to, to, to having a different, a different approach, a different mindset. Um, so, yeah, t it's going to be tougher for everyone, for sure. But I think, you know, the fact that there's going to be arguably fewer restaurants, um, it doesn't mean that there will be any less need for, for PR. I don't know if, if, if you agree, Nikki and, and, and Tom. Yeah, I agree with exactly what you're saying. I think it's about adapting. I think social, a lot of our clients have seen their social growing because they've had time, more time and more... I guess more more time to put effort into looking at what they're posting. I think their engagement has has definitely definitely grown. Um, but I think it's about adapting our business. To, um, everything we do at Source is in hospitality, but um, there are a few brands that will you know support us when we're trying to get back on with our restaurants. We will look at reduced fees for clients because they will have reduced covering uh, covers. I was talking to Henry Cripps, who's got lovely local pubs by us, and he works on a 10% profit. And he just said, there is no room for him to be reducing his dining room because it, it just won't be viable, the business to... So I think it, it, it's gonna be very, very hard and people are gonna have to adapt. He's just launched a delivery service to keep the cash flow coming in, but it's about adapting and and um, yeah, again, back to survival, real survival. I think like the hospitality market is highly competitive anyway. Restaurant margins are pretty tight at the best of times. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it is just, you know, we're working with brands that do have a bit more money now. Um, and if you think 70 years ago, people didn't really eat out of restaurants. It was something that the rich did more than the general population. Now everyone does. But there will be demand for restaurants. So one hopes that they will if they do close, they will start owning again at some point and the market will be back again. Mm. Yeah. What about, um, what, sorry. No, I just feel, I, I wonder if neighbourhood restaurants are going to be the first ones that sort of get back on their feet. Look, I live, I live out in Great Misson in Buckinghamshire and I know there's a real, there's a real sense of loyalty to local businesses. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, and so I think the first release will be, you know, to go and support your local neighbourhood restaurant that you're pleased to see the doors open again. I do feel for the restaurants in central, central London, because they're going to struggle more than, you know, we work with like Ellis Barry um, with the Maramgrass. He's been open doing deliveries to locals. So you have that sense of community. You keep your customers involved and that kind of thing. And it's going to be a while before people are willing to get on the tube and go back to central London. Whereas if your local restaurant up the road opens, fantastic. Like you, you might take the opportunity to go there. Yeah, Richard, is that something that you agree with? I do agree, basically. I think, as everyone's saying, the local restaurants, you know, for many reasons, including loyalty, will get, should get going faster than others. But uh, again, when I was speaking to Claire Smith, she was saying those local neighbourhood restaurants, to some extent, depend on having 
fairly accessible prices and a lot of people coming in. And again, if they have to do social distancing on the tight margins, you know, they could be, you know, they could be in quite some difficulty. Yeah, and, and what about um, your audience, Richard, that you write for? What are they after? What are they looking at you to provide at the minute? Because obviously things have changed. It's not, you know, you can't be, there's not a new opening that, you know, there's, there's not that side of, of what, you're, what you normally do. So what, what, is the, what is the demand for you at the minute? Yeah, it's difficult, isn't there? It seems to me there are three stores at the moment. They're kind of food stories, like what you can cook at, uh, uh, cook at home or what you can get delivered. There's the charity story, which, you know, who's cooking for the NHS and for care workers. And um, there's state of the restaurant industry when it comes back. And personally, I'm finding that everything I do is a variant of those, really, to be honest. Yeah, and I've seen that you're doing your three-minute meals as well. Yeah, found, it seems to be a lot of people have time on their hands and they're wanting to do stuff and go on, the, uh, go on social media and get some attention and so on. I thought, I'll have a bit of that. <laughs> They're very entertaining. <laughs> um, um, but also, Richard, it must be, it'd be quite sad, I mean, for all of you, it'd be sad to see some of the restaurants that you love go. Oh, it's terrible because, well, all the people we all mix with, really, are from the restaurant business. And you know people who spent years developing, years before they even opened the business, and then, mm. you know, years building it up. And the fact they could just lose it is shocking, isn't it? This further, which I think is brilliant, and I think government's done a fantastic job but it's to some extent it has just uh, it's obscured the picture a bit we don't really know how businesses are you know the restaurant closures we've heard of at the moment are people who are kind of in trouble and not doing well already <clears throat> and you know i'm talking about people like mark hicks for example i love mark but his restaurants weren't profitable and we don't really know who's going to survive and who's not but it's very you know i just feel on a personal level for all the people involved it's the pitch is terrible. Well, we're kind of on a precipice at this point with as soon as furlough ends, that's when it's going to start. Because yeah. if the restaurants do all open, running at 40% of, of um, taking, like you're, you're going to have to let a lot of staff go. And then you'll start seeing restaurants closing again. Some maybe they won't reopen just because they won't be able to. It's, it's really going to be a competitive time. Yeah. I also, when I was talking to Sat, we were talking about the over 70s market and that builds quite a lot of the, the especially in the midweek lunches, a lot of that, um, that age group go out. And we were saying mm. actually, a lot of them will not return to the restaurants until the vaccine's in place. Yeah. Again, that's another huge market mm. that our restaurateurs are going to lose, especially for lunchtime trade. Yeah. Then have the set lunch and a lovely bottle of wine. Um, that's a huge market. And again, Sat and I were talking, he said, I wonder again if they will come out until we have a vaccine in place. And the tourists and the gastro tourists yeah, and the tourists. business business dining to some extent. I think that's gonna take a long time to get back. Yeah, for sure. I think also the um the price point issue is is going to be something that um that operators are going to have to consider because it's an interesting one because I suppose there's a lot of people who are going to be much poorer. But equally, there will still be quite a lot of people who uh, are arguably that much that, you know, that little bit richer because they've been at home working and on full full pay, essentially, but not haven't been able to spend any money whilst they've been at home. So I don't know how that's going to play out. But I still I, I do think that price point is going to be very sensitive. Yeah, and we're working with some of our chefs, getting them to do live tutorials um, mm. with some of the concierges. So th there is a market out there. And I'm afraid. <laughs> Are you ready for yeah. your, your ingredients? <laughs> their, um, their, you know, their, their customers for these concierges would usually spend a huge amount of money in the next two months, the sort of spring comes summer, you know, the holidays. They still have that money in some cases. Um, so there will be some demand. But then if you look at our industry, certainly I think the PRs won't be eating out quite as much on their own time because, you know, the clients are gone. Yeah, I mean... I don't know about you, but I'm literally desperate to go back to restaurants and bars oh, and that kind of normality. Uh, desperate. Yeah. yeah. However, I know that I'm not necessarily the majority because I do speak to friends and family who are not in this industry, but they go to restaurants. And a lot of them are way more cautious than I thought they would be. I, I didn't think that there would be an element of, oh, I'm not sure if I want to do that. So are we going to see a stampede back to restaurants or are, is it going to be like a drip fed, waiting for a virus? bit uncertain whether they should or shouldn't i mean i don't think you're going to see a stampede i think you'll see a small stampede of 
the likes of us, um, <laughs> industry, and some of the younger people who don't necessarily, you know, not so worried about getting coronavirus or the effects that it can have on them, who mm. will are waiting for the opportunity to go and have a drink in a restaurant back to normal. But there are so many things that restaurants have to consider before people are going to come back in comfortably. And bars are going to be worse hit, aren't they? I mean, yeah. bars, I just can't see where that goes. If you look at Hong Kong, the, the restaurants are allowed to open, the bars aren't. So, you know, you go and have your temperature check, you give all your details to a restaurant so that if someone's sick, they can, can't, they can monitor you, let everyone who was in the restaurant know that they could have been infected. But bars, you, you are too close to people. Like it, It's just going to take so much longer. Yeah. I mean, it's going to take some serious, serious adapting, isn't it? So, I mean, the success of the hospitality industry, like coming back from this, I suppose kind of like my final question for all of you is, does that do, you, do your roles rely on the success of the hospitality industry or not? I know you've kind of talked a little bit about how you diversify and things like that, but if the hospitality industry isn't successful, the knock-on effects, not even just for PR, but everyone that relies on that industry are, are going to be quite massive, right? Um, without the hospitality industry, um, we are not in a, in a great place, that's for sure. Yeah. But, we, I mean, we've... Um ultimately there's no there's there won't be restaurant prs if there's no restaurants but one hopes that the demand's going to be there when it, when this all comes back mm. yeah and, and nikki do you believe that, that that it will come back hospitality it's not it, it will come back to, to where it was or at least I think, yeah i can't say that it'll come back to where it was i think um it will eventually years um i think this is going to take us time to bounce back from and i think the one big thing is we are certainly a really great community and I feel especially with Jonathan Downey spearheading and bringing the whole industry together if you're a Michelin starred chef or a or a takeaway I feel like we've got a really strong community um, a strong community and we all work together um, and work against all these challenges of social distancing and vaccines and um, consumer confidence I think together we will we will get the industry back on its feet. But I do think, as Richard pointed out, there's there's going to be a lot of heartbreak on the way. And we've all been in this industry a long time, and all of these chefs are our friends, and everybody's worked so hard. And it, it it's going to be a journey. But I think if you know if we all pull together, I, we will get through. And there will always be a need for a restaurant PR in my mind. But <laughs> um, yeah. I think I think Nikki, I, you're, I, I agree with you totally. I think there's always going to be a need for restaurants too. You know, that's what we, we, as humans we 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 need. You know, to 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 come together and and you know drink and and eat. I think you know, but it's it's a matter of how long it takes to, you know, it's it's a matter of when it, when the doors can reopen and how long it takes for the the operators to get to a point where they are you know stable and can you know can last the test of time. I think time it's going to be, go on Richard. Sorry, I think it's going to be like 2008, but much, much worse. At that stage, suddenly a lot of the money was wiped out, the corporate dining, the huge expense accounts and restaurants were badly hurt. But now you've got all that and on top of that, the health concerns, people not wanting to go out and be in crowds and so on. So I'm certainly very worried for the first few months. Slightly longer term, of course, everything will bounce back. But it could take well into next year, I think. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's a, matter. a very hard year, a very hard year. Yeah, and restaurants are just going to have to be so clever. You know, private dining might have been something that people looked at as uh, something sort of for corporate, but now maybe it's the perfect thing for a family can go sit in a room that's separate from the main restaurant. That kind mm. of thing is really going to come to the forefront. And one of the only good things to come out of all of this, for me, has just been the community that you see through Instagram with the chefs and everyone. Obviously, they have more time to be on it, but it is... It has been so nice as part of the hospitality industry to see everyone fighting for, you know, the pause on rent and the, the early days of asking for the restaurants to be closed. That kind of thing has been, it's been amazing to watch. And Tom, is there still going to be um, a space for um, like Instagram uh, influencers when it comes to food? Because obviously the, the restrictions are going to be very interesting. Um, yeah. Do you think there's still going to be enough room for everybody? Because, the, you know, there's plenty of them. So... It, it may cut down the uh, the numbers of them that are out there, which maybe is not such a bad thing. I mean, I like PRs, Instagrammers are um, they feed off the the uh, the industry and they survive through the industry. So they're obviously getting no paychecks at the moment unless they're working with the, the bigger brands. 
But if you look at, for instance, Finland, they, and they do have a 34 year old prime minister, so this will explain it, but they use, they made uh, influencers uh, uh, essential workers. So they started sending out information to it, not to all of them, but to a bigger list of them to get information on COVID-19 as it was spreading, because it's the quickest way to get into someone's house who doesn't read the traditional media. So I think in the same way, restaurants are going to be using them more than ever to get, you know, if you, if you see Pizza Pilgrim's new kit or Patty and Bun's kits, they have spread over Instagram so fast. Everybody knows about them before some of the traditional media gets them. So obviously both parts, traditional and Instagram are going to play, you know, part of this rebuild, but I just think social is going to be at the forefront of it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really interesting and how we're all going to come out of this is also like really interesting. So, and I know this question is a bit, how long is a piece of string, but ideally for you all, what, what's the best case scenario for you? So what, time frame would you like to see you know restaurants starting to open um them getting back to i mean we keep saying normal but i don't know what normal is going to be so um but time frame wise for you from a, with your business head on what is the best scenario well, Richard? <laughs> i'll go first as nobody else did i mean as you know more places are opening for delivery and click and collect which is I guess that's going to be the pattern over the next few weeks or a month or two. My best case scenario would be for, and I'm just guessing, would be for restaurants to start reopening in some form in July. Okay. And is everyone, is that kind of in agreement or? I mean, yeah, I think, I think that, you know, this, the sooner the better, obviously, but I think, you know, there's just so many other factors that um, need to be considered and we just, you know, so much changes from day to day, week to week. Um, that um, it's difficult to know. And I think to just, you know, it's going to come down to, to consumer confidence ultimately. And, and we just, we just it, I mean, I feel personally completely different to how I felt, you know, a few weeks ago with regards to, you know, whether I want to contract the virus or not, you know? Um, and I think, you know, everybody does feel differently day to day, week to week. And so, um, I, ju I just don't think, you know, I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, ultimately, it'd be great to have the restaurants open in, in July, um, you know, or even September, um, but we'll just have to wait and see. I think to, I think to survive, and if furlough is going to end for our industry at the end of June, the 1st of July is the date that we need to, you know, to get the restaurants up and running. I still don't think it's out of the picture, but what do I know that they might not extend furlough for our industry? And again, it's all related with the daily death figures isn't it and the bigger picture out there like Tanya's saying I think people's opinions are changing day by day I think we've all had friends that have had the virus um, we've all heard the horror stories so but from a business point of view it would be nice to get the doors open on the 1st of July I think we'll all you know yes yeah and I think we all plan for the worst scenario that it opens and people don't go but the power of seeing people going out and eating again will have a massive effect as you start to feel maybe it's not as bad, maybe it's mm. true. And not saying that's a good thing. And obviously every restaurant that opens needs to consider, can they pay their staff? Is it safe for their staff to work? All those sort of things. But I think it will, a momentum will start to build when people sort of want to get back to normal life. And a big concern obviously is not opening too early because the last thing we want is another lockdown. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Brilliant. Well, um, that's all my questions. Thank you so much for talking to me. Um, obviously, fingers crossed that, I mean, July would be amazing for all of us because we're all very much in limbo, aren't we? So that would be brilliant. Any form of exit strategy now would be lovely, just so that we had some sort of idea of what we're doing. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much and good luck with everything going forward. And I'm sure I'll speak to you all again soon. Thank you, Cara. Thanks, Cara. Thanks, Cara. Thanks, Thanks so much. Okay. Bye, guys.